Hello and welcome to Romance Isn't Dead, episode 20. The one that isn't, Whitney, my love. Hi, Ray. How are you doing? Yeah. Not too bad. I'm looking forward to a few days off work that aren't mm-hmm. the weekend. Ah, yes. Yeah, yes, and yes, yes. I know. They are the important ones, the ones that aren't the weekend. You know, mm-hmm. you get all your housework done, you sit on the balcony with a coffee in the morning and just think about all those poor saps that are still going to work. Though are I you, will be one. Are you talking about <laughs> you or are you talking about everyone? Because I don't sit on a balcony and watch the poor saps. I have kids. No, <laughs> well, okay, so I'm talking about me. I'll sit there with, with my cat lying over my feet so they sweat really badly. Anyone has a really furry cat, they'll have the same experience. And then just do nothing. Oh, God, that sounds so nice right now. <laughs> oh, I bet it does. I bet it does. It, it sounds lovely. I agree. It sounds lovely. Um, yeah. What about you? Uh, well, I had a week off because of the holiday in the United States, the 4th. Yeah, and... I will say she's looking really tan. <laughs> <laughs> I just go red and blister. And, well, this was this is a week out. So you can imagine what I looked like a week ago. Yeah, when I was tan. Yeah, I was ridiculously tan. But um, anyway, uh, I... Um, I spent the week up at my parents' house. My parents have a, a home. They live they live on a lake nearby, and so we have a camper, and we took our camper up there and, and stayed across the street from their house. They had some property across the street, and um, we spent every afternoon on the boat, and yeah, I, I really was feeling, uh, you know... <laughs> relaxed calm it's it, it, it is a, it is very relaxing on one level and the other thing is it really does bring home to me how much I have um like how much I should appreciate what I have and because so many people don't have that kind of opportunity so it really does every time I get on the, the lake I think that that wow this is really a privilege that I, yeah. I should be um really grateful for because you know I mean anybody can go to the lake but not everybody has access to you know sitting on a boat and riding around and um and uh, stopping for ice cream with the kids yeah. or whatever so her facebook feed was full of pictures of oh this is what i'm doing right now with her legs just propped up on the boat <laughs> <laughs> and i was sitting in the office looking at this thinking no this is so not fair i want to be there i hate and I you see <laughs> yeah you're like i hate you um I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I would, I would not, um, I would, uh, I would have stayed at the house with you, Ray. I would have let everyone else go out and we could have sat on the, the dock or whatever and, and, and tried swim. to write. <laughs> gotcha. Well, here's the real irony, right? I get really, really creative when I'm sitting on the boat and looking at the houses as we go on by and, and, and I'm looking at, you know, the areas that haven't been developed and so on. And I get really, cr- I'm like, oh, this could go in my original fic and da, 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 da. And then I get back and. Like, nah, I'll nothing. have a glass of wine. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so it is what it is, I suppose. But anyway, t- he, today we are here to talk about A Kingdom of Dreams by Judith McNaught, right? We are indeed. Written okay. in 1989. Wow. That long ago, so, 30 years 30 ago. 30 years. All 30 right. years this year. And how did it age, I suppose, is the first question to ask. I actually don't think it aged badly because mm-hmm. it was written Wait, based should, during the 15th century. Right. Should we go ahead and do a synopsis for any listeners who may not have read this book recently? If you haven't, if you haven't it really needs to go on your... It's on my much-loved list. My copy is... Actually, I had to wrap it in a a plastic. Um, it's been wrapped in it, to be fair, for about twenty years. But it had to go in one of those plastic book cases because pages have started to come out of my copy. And to be fair, my copy is twenty eight years old, and it smells gorgeous. I love the smell of old paperbacks, and it smells incredible. The pages are yellowed. I was just saying before we started this, I said to <laughs> Sally, oh, I've got a receipt in here. And this receipt is dated 
November 2008, and I've been using it as a bookmark. <laughs> it's yellowed. <laughs> I'm surprised you can even see it anymore. Yeah, it's, like, it's, see the writing it's, on it. The really bad thing is every single item on this list, bar three, are chocolate. <laughs> Double decker. This when double deckers, and if anybody lives in the UK, double deckers and dairy milk. Not one item on this list cost over forty three p, and now they're like sixty two p. <laughs> so that's how old this book is, or how old my copy is. Anyway, the book is about. Um, it's the first in a series. That was never really finished. I believe that um, the book that keeps on being teased is another sequel that is based during Regency times, I think. Anyway, this one is the first in the series about the Westmoreland family. It's the origins of their title because um, Royce Westmoreland is given the title of Duke of Claymore in this. So his title outranks that of his bride, very reluctant bride. But it starts with um, two sisters, two Scottish sisters, being kidnapped from outside a nunnery. Mm -hmm. Which, um, being based in the late 15th century, before um, we had the founding of the Church of England, because Henry VIII wasn't around to divorce his many wives and get told by the church he wasn't allowed to do it anymore. Um, everything was Catholic. And the Pope interferes when the two girls are kidnapped from church grounds, or yeah. questionably questionably from outside church grounds um and a reluctant girl is affianced to her abductor who happens to be known as the wolf but is also royce westmoreland at that point the earl of claymore at that point the earl of claymore he is type he is given the title by king henry after and, battlefield exploits at the Battle of Bosworth Hill, or Bosworth Field, rather. Um, Field. And uh, that is, of course, when Henry uh, ended the Plantagenet line and um, took over for the Tudors. So, if you're a history person, that gives you an idea. Um, and it's pretty bloody. It's pretty yeah, bloody. well, isn't it? It's not the... the um, founding of one of Henry VIII's, of um, William Shakespeare's plays. Anyway, Jennifer is a reluctant bride, though she, partially because she hears, well, she is, her father is horrible, by the way. He's a jerk. He is a jerk. He's terrible, especially to her. Yeah. Like, he yeah. defines misogyny. Oh my god! Yeah, but then so does so does one of her so do a couple of her brothers. To be fair, yeah, no, I mean, well, being yeah, terrible people, yeah, make all the Scots look bad. <laughs> anyway, she is told she, after she is returned to her family, she is told that she has to marry Royce because it is the agreement that the, the church is demanding reparation, uh, the king, King James is demanding reparations, and Henry is kind of sitting there going, well, okay, so you're all demanding them, this is what we'll do. So they're kind of forced to get together, but her father has other ideas. He's horrific. He has an idea originally, he's going to get one of her aunts to drug Royce so that he can never continue his line. And then he realises that plan won't necessarily work. So he decides he's going to send her off to a nunnery and say that this after is what she, she did. Yeah. After she marries After they're him. married. Yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of subplots going on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we haven't even talked about the first part of the book. So there's a ton of stuff going on, right? Yeah. So. It's interesting. That's what I love about this book. So much happens in it. And it's not badly written. It's well researched. Um, there aren't things shoved in there for no reason. Mm -hmm. And I think that I love 
the character of Jennifer. Mm. <laughs> I'm just waiting for you to say something. <laughs> I'm just letting you finish. Go ahead. Go on. <laughs> I I think that she is determined. For, she's basically her entire family. She She's been blamed for things that she wasn't responsible for because her stepbrother wanted her to be alienated from her family from her clan and, and they all the re- fell for it oh yeah they all fell for it but her her being sent to the nunnery in the first place where she's originally abducted from was all because she refused to marry a man older than her father mm-hmm. at the age of 14 absolutely absolutely so we can we can absolutely say that um, she is ahead of her time in terms of, hey, I want to, I, I don't, she, she's, she's sort of the stereotypical, not stereotypical, but, but the rebellious teenage daughter, right? And yeah, but she's, she's only 17. Yeah, in this book, she's yeah. only 17, and then Royce is 29. Um, they kind of buried that in there for us, I think, to let her, because, you know, um, that is an age gap, but it's not an insurmountable age gap. And, and he's not old enough to be her father. Right, 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 right. And and so, and, and, and she's old enough for it not to be icky for a modern reader, and that's really good. Let me just say this, though. Go for it. Every time I read her name, it took me out of the book. Jennifer is not a name for 15th century Britain. It's not. Or no. Scotland. It is, that name is, comp- I mean, that is, that name didn't come into common usage until, like, the 1800s. And I don't mean 1805. I mean, like, 1880 is when it starts showing up on the census records. So, this is not a name that she should have named her heroine. And if she wanted a name similar to that, like, Jenny, spelled with a G, would have been more acceptable than she should have, you know, spelled it as G-I-N-N, uh, you know what I mean? Why? Why? Yeah. Or G-I-N-N-I-F-E-R, if you want. But every time I read J-E-N-N, I'm like, that's not hey. a name in 1500. <laughs> it made me crazy. It made me nuts. And so when you <laughs> said, when you said it was real well-researched, I'm like, yeah, but maybe she should have just, you know, Ran through babynames.com first, although it didn't exist back then. Yeah, but then that <sighs> said, I think that there are a lot of books that are less well researched when it comes to historical accuracy. I mean, sure. she's got the historical basis in fact, the name is the thing that went wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and there were other things that, that were kind of iffy, but. But I totally agree that it was better researched than many that I have read. And it doesn't, that in itself doesn't drive me. The problem with that name, the using that name, was it took me out of the story every time I saw it. Does that make sense? Is that only this time you read it or previous times as well? Because you've read it before as well, haven't you? I've read it before, but I think it might be one of the reasons why I haven't read it as much as I've read others. Because that name just, I'm like, it's not right. <laughs> Which sounds like such an OCD kind of thing. But um, I don't, I, I try not to to let picky things like, but it, it, picky things like that. But, and if she'd been a side character, fine. But this is a name on every single page, you know, <laughs> every single page. And so it took me out of the story with every single page. And I'm like, ah. So change the spelling on her name. Like maybe they chose to do that because of modern readers and a concern that modern readers wouldn't know how to pronounce the name. Whatever. Which is why they, which is why when it came to um, a Goblet of Fire, they actually spelt out Hermione's name in the book with her telling Victor Crumb how to say it because yeah. people were struggling with how to sell, how to say Hermione. Yeah. No, absolutely. And and you know, it, it takes it takes people out of books since I just it's not that I don't want people I, I just this is one that in terms of historical um 
accuracy or whatever that 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 is one thing that just sort of stood out to me that happened but then it's that that's a you thing Mm -hmm. because most people would not be aware of that in respect of reading a a historical romance unless they are history fiends like you i mean to be fair in the united states the year i was born the single most popular name for girls was jennifer the single mo- the year I was born. So when I was growing up, there were five Jennifers in every classroom, right? There was always a Jennifer floating around because it was such a popular name. And so I think my issue is that it's not a biblical name that naturally would have been around, right? And so my issue was that that it just it, it just did not ring true to me. Now, that said, that said, she's very feisty. And and I was getting a little impatient with her because I felt like she was really selfish. Like she killed the horse at the beginning and she didn't mean to, but she killed that horse at the beginning. And that just broke my heart because I love horses. Yeah, but then, but then she cried a lot about that because right. she said, he threw me off before we jumped. Right. No, 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 no. Absolutely. But she... She's very immature, and I have to remind myself that she's 17. Um, And so there's these... And she's been cloistered in an eye. Yeah, there's there's (laughs) these fits and starts with her, right? And the thing that made me come around to Jennifer more um, is that... (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, the face you pulled just then was hilarious. (laughs) Um, The thing that made me come around to her character more was when she was having this discussion with Royce and she looked at him and she said, what would you want your daughter to do? Right. Cause he's like, you have made my life a living hell for the last blah, blah, blah. Right. And he's going on about how she's sewed up his shirts and ripped his blankets to shreds and, and, and the, his men's blankets to shreds. And she's done all of these things to harm him right? She's tried to get away. She's killed his horse. She's done all of these things. And she just looks at me. She's like, how would you want your daughter to behave? And I was like, oh, you know what? You're right. You know, from his perspective, this is a pain in the neck. How is she, why is she doing this? Right. But from the perspective of your enemy has captured your child, wouldn't you want your child to fight back? Certainly her father would want her to fight back. Even though her father absolutely treats her like garbage I mean, for the majority well, she, of the time. For him, she, but she still com- loves him. Yeah. For him, she is a commodity. Period. She's yeah. a commodity. And, and a way to find revenge on his enemies, a way for him to get for to move forward in the world. I did not understand her being sort of the Countess of Rockbourne in her own. Yes, because oh, right. um, Scot- Scottish titles are matriarchal. They're handed down okay. the mother's line. So um, okay. her mother inherited that title. Therefore, her oldest child would inherit the title. There was no patri- patriarchal lineage thing. Okay, okay. As there is in the British royal family. Okay, okay. So that's fair. I, I just, I didn't really get that. And that's interesting. Um, it, it, it does explain it somewhat. She inherited the yeah, title from her mother. I just wasn't sure that it was accurate, but now it is. Okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I just, it, I didn't care enough about it to go looking. So that also says something like that didn't bother me enough to go looking to see like the name did. Now, um, I just, uh, yeah. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting that, that McNaught does with this book that she is not, that you don't see a lot. This is based in Lowland, Scotland. Mm. And that's actually where my ancestors are from. A lot of them are from Lowland, Scotland. And it's interesting because normally the books are about the Highlands, right? And the Highlanders are kind of hoity-toity about Lowlanders and they're, they're, they're kind of because scornful. Because the Lowlands are closer to the English right. therefore right. they're easier to invade really yeah they are and so you know I enjoyed that they were uh, that, that this was set in lowland Scotland because it hadn't I don't see a lot of that like the Highlanders that insular world of the clans and of the Highlands 
set that that makes for really good setting for for novels, right? And so it's mm. not very often that you see a no, a novelist maybe tackle the lowlands. I'm sure it's been done before, but this this was to me interesting. And I know she had to do it of a necessity, right? Because he had to be able to she get needed, there. Yeah, he had to yeah. be able to get there. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. Um, I. There were some question of, you know what, I'm not even going to nitpick it. I mean, in the end, she makes her choices, right? She um, makes her choices and she makes her decisions based on her life experience and how she has been mm -hmm. living. I mean, the thing that really always got me was her father clearly doesn't care if she's happy, doesn't give an absolute flying fig about anything to do with her even though she mm -hmm. is his child mm -hmm. I think and she's his only child I think because the mm -hmm. others are stepchildren and they take precedence over his own child mm -hmm. which is horrific and one of the comments that stuck by me was when her father said you have the look of your mother obviously he didn't like his first wife on some level <laughs> Right. Maybe he maybe he was forced to marry her and he resented her for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. It's it's pretty clear he does not have any love for his daughter. And that is gross. That's really sad. And but it's also his his view of her as a commodity. I think it's very is, British. But it's also very historically accurate in terms of how women have been treated over the course of the last few thousand years uh, in Western civilization. So, yeah, we're chattel. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. So, um, what about a heat rating on this book? I think we could do a heat rating on this book. Well, I'd say that it's, I mean, Judith McNaught's books tend to be far less. There was no, at least there was no, it feels strange. <laughs> That's a problem. Just, That's it a is problem. a problem. It is a massive problem for me. Every single his, most of the Regency ones we've read recently, the line, it feels strange, always occurs when the characters first have sex. There was none of that. I was so relieved. Um, but then McNaught's books are back to the, I'd say, the golden era of historical romance. Mm -hmm. The late 80s, early 90s, when... <sighs> McNaught was writing, Garwood was starting to write her books, Catherine Coulter was writing her historical romances that weren't based with a thriller in the side of them, um, Joanna Lindsay was prevalent, she was releasing a book every six months, she was from that era of romance, the era that I really loved. And I don't know if that's because I'm a child of the 80s. Hello, Stranger Things really said that one for me. But it was the era that I started reading them. Because mm -hmm. when I got this book, I was 17. I was the same age as the, as Jennifer mm -hmm. when I got this book. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I bought this book when I was 17 years old. Um, and maybe that's why I identified with her a lot more. Mm -hmm. in many ways because she was she was quite modern for the 15th century mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. she was um rebellious she knew what she wanted and she was having to go with a flow that she felt uncomfortable with mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a lot of it was to do with seeking parental approval Mm -hmm. because she was desperate for her people to love her and that is where this title originates mm -hmm. yeah. she dreamed yes she dreamed uh, that is a for me that was a really moving scene mm -hmm. where he fought her after their first night together when he takes her as his mistress though he ultimately goes through things with his brother stefan who ends up with her sister but we won't go there um and he says of his intention to marry her Mm -hmm. to make her the lady of the manor rather than I mean the name that they come up with her come up with for her is horrific and it's all because of a misheard comment mm 
mm-hmm. the Merrick smut, which I think is horrible. Mm-hmm. But she has a dream of being the lady of a kingdom where everybody loves her and there is still hardship that she can help them to overcome because she's seen as kind and loving and mm-hmm. everything else. And that's what she wants. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really, that says something about who she is as a person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does too. Um, I, I, aside from a few nitpicky things, I I did like this book. Um, I did like this book. And if, her name, if her name had been... If it had um, been Jennifer with a G-I-N-N, then I wouldn't have been... You know, or, or Genevieve. You still could have called her Jenny. If you wanted to call her Jenny, Genevieve. Or she could have been Rebecca or Rachel or Roberta after Robert the Bruce, which would have made sense for Scotland or anything like that. She could have been, it would have been less jarring for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing that anything. But for me, I didn't think of that when I read the book because I, A, I sort of, I suppose in a way I'd grown used to it because it is a frequent read for me. But... I mean, that that being said, Royce isn't exactly a commonly used name either. It's not, but it <laughs> sounds very old school. And I think Jennifer bothered me because I knew so many Jennifers growing up. It was too popular in the 1980s as a name for middle class America for me to be able to ignore it. Royce I could ignore because I didn't know any Royces. Does that make sense? Yeah. Totally. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And so I, and it's, it's, I'm nit, it sounds like I'm nitpicking. I'm not meaning to. It's just that it is what it is. So that having been said, I did enjoy this book. Um, if you want a romance novel that doesn't have any touch of potential dubious consent, this is not a book for you. Because you can, if you tug it a little bit, make it dubious consent um because she's kind of forced into making the call that she's going to sleep with him because she's concerned her sister's having a her sister's she's concerned her sister's dying so she makes this deal to get her sister free and and so if that to you is non-consent or dubious consent then this is probably not the book for you um Ultimately, though, remember, it was written in the 80s. It's based in the 15th century. And he treats her way better than most women in the 15th century would have been treated. I, I You know, you don't have to convince me. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not I, trying to convince you. I'm trying to convince our readers, our okay. listeners. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, you need to be aware of that. If that is a trip for you or a trigger for you, then maybe steer clear of this book. But, but if you understand like when this book was written and if you understand this is way better than some of the it wasn't like she was saying no and he's like well I'll make you like it and then you forgive him for that no it wasn't it wasn't that she went into that sort of with her eyes open which is what well, doesn't she she says at one point um she says was not my will to be in your bed but once I was there it was not my will to leave it either right Right, which is why I'm saying it's not that it's not that really bad. Um, it's not a blatant. She's yeah. saying, "No way, I don't want you." Right, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So that's why I'm putting it in a, a slightly different category. Uh, but I just want to make sure that our listeners understand that 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 going in, if that's a problem for them, then maybe steer clear. But if you understand that, like the time frame and all of that stuff and um, maybe modern names and old fashioned books don't bother you, then this is maybe a book that you would enjoy. Um, and it is the prequel to Whitney, my love and Whitney, my love is probably McNaught's seminal classic. Um, it's the book that everybody, if, right. if you know romance novels, it's going to be the book that you know her for. Right. You're going to, you're going to have said, Oh, Judith McNaught, didn't she write that one about, and then you'll go, ah. Right, and this is sort of the origin story for that family, for the the, the Duke's Westmoreland's. Family, the Westmorelands. So, 
I would, I, I like it. I, I do. I like it. It was one of my favorite books years ago. So, um, I, I'm not really arguing about that. I just, I'm reading it a little more sensitive to those issues, I think, today than I did 30 years ago or even 20 years ago or whenever the last time I read this book was. So today it's a, a little more, I, I, I I just try to be a little more cognizant of it, especially when I'm getting on a podcast and talk about it. You know what I mean? Um, I'm trying to, to be a little more cognizant of those issues, but they didn't really bother me coming through that first time. So, yeah, that was my sort of final thought on this book. So. You did say that there was something that you felt she said, which had a great deal of meaning earlier. So what was it that she said at the end that made you think about the book more? And now you're going, oh God, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm staring at you like, I don't know what I said that. Yeah, you did. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I think maybe it was that, wasn't it that line where she's like, oh, what would you want your daughter to do? Like, it made me think about her differently uh, because she's, she's actually doing what she thinks is right. She's, yeah, she's, she, she's she, not yeah. just being a petulant child. And that, that made me ease up on her a lot because I was like, you know what? She's, because I was immediately coming off that horse situation. I was like, oh my, <laughs> you yeah, know. That. And the, the remorse that she felt for the horse's passing, and he named his horse Thor, by the way. Um, the remorse she felt about the horse's death, it was, clear because she he made her sleep in his tents Mm -hmm. that night after they tried their escape attempt separated from her sister and she spent most of the night crying Mm -hmm. over the horse's death that's all she could focus on the -hmm. fact that the horse had sacrificed himself because he knew that there was danger behind beyond the leap over this tree branch that was in their path He'd thrown her off and mm-hmm. she was mourning that. So she wasn't, she wasn't, she was responsible for the horse's death in so far as she stole the horse to escape from her captors. And then forced the fact- him to take a jump that he was trying to tell her not to take. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But she's remorseful of that rather than, ha ha, I killed your horse. Yeah. No, I, again, I think it, a lot of it comes and bat- from... And to be honest, battle horses in that era died in far more brutal ways. I understand. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, it, when she says to him, what would you have your daughter do? That kind of helped me forgive that character a little bit for doing the things that she was doing because it made me understand. And then later on, I got really impatient with Royce because he wasn't as understanding as he should have been with the the priory thing the nunnery thing the nun coming to take her away yeah which she didn't even know she didn't know and and he wasn't willing to hear her and I was real impatient with him about that too so I I, but it all makes for a very good romance romance book tension and it is the thing is this is purely a romance novel it's not it's not a romance with a murder on the side mm-hmm. like Dream Man or a mystery on the side like the um, Stephanie Lawrence book that we read. Mm-hmm. It's not one of those. This is a pure classic romance novel. Mm-hmm. So the tension is between the two of them. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, is there anything else we need to say about no, this we book? Still need to, we still need to give it a chilly rating because um, we started on that one and then went off on a tangent. That was mostly my fault. <laughs> yeah, let's blame you. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Totally I'm blamed for mostly. I'm fine with that. I don't know. I wouldn't say it was super, super hot because. But as the scenes that of, they did have, they were pretty steamy. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say probably f- between five and six. Being honest, because I don't think it was explicit. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, I was thinking five, so uh, we could give it a five to a six, yep. somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, and, and mostly because there weren't a lot of scenes, but the scenes that there were were pretty steamy. So you probably wouldn't want, you probably wouldn't want your 14 year old reading this. Right. This is definitely not YA. 
Now, this is not YA, but however, if your 14 year old is incredibly is incredibly mature and you have had those conversations with them, I wouldn't say that it is one. It's not Jackie Collins or Jilly Cooper. It's closer to Danielle Steele ish than Jackie Collins. Okay. All right. Well, where can people find you on social media, right? I am at um, on Twitter. I've actually changed my username. Finally, it's only taken me about three years, and I am all about Ray. Um, that's R A Y E. And uh, obviously, we're also at ISN Romance, which is updated regularly. So follow us on there if you want to find out more about what we're doing and how we've how things have happened and whether we've managed to get a hold of books. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> because that was one of the things we have been talking about is my local library's inability to get hold of new books anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, we won't go there. Um, and Sally, what about you? Uh, you can find me as Palmetta Blue on Twitter, and I think it's Palmetta Blue 2016 on Instagram. If you follow my Instagram, I'm sorry, there's a lot of yarn. It's very I yarny. Think. I take lots of crochet pictures because I am that big of a nerd. And I have been participating in the Lion Brand My Hometown um, contest. So, yeah, I don't expect to win, but I thought it was kind of fun. And, yeah. Well, that's why there's all the pictures of you posting with yarn all around yes, the city. Yes, yes. I did, I did wonder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lion Brand actually liked those pictures, by the way. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, Lion Brand came along and liked those. So, and my, I know it's just, thought, yeah, yeah. I know it's somebody behind a desk going, "Oh, okay. Let me let me click on this uh, hashtag. Okay, I'll just like all these pictures." But it was a massive like, so it was nice. You see, I'm I'm more happy about the fact that one of my work, uh, the one of the posts that I did for work was liked by Aston Martin. So. Oh, well, that's that's a that's a big get. That's a big get. Yeah, that's a pretty big one. But that was uh, work, not yeah. my personal stuff. Um, and then if you follow me on Twitter, I haven't been talking a whole lot recently. But I tend to talk a lot about Star Wars and the enemies to lovers trope there. So, anyway. She's a right though. Yeah. <laughs> you say that like it's a bad thing. It's so no, bad. No, well, I'm not, I'm not a, you see, I'm not a Star Wars nerd. But, um, <laughs> oh, but there are plenty of people who think it's a bad thing are convinced that I am now, I'm a, they are convinced that if you are a Raylo, you are an abuse apologist and a Nazi apologist. Isn't that, uh, yeah, okay. I'm not going to touch that comment with the barge pole because at the moment my Twitter feed is, I follow a lot of writers, British um, writers, mostly com- um, comedian, comedy writers in the UK on my Twitter feed. And it has been a lot of, um, because I come from England, obviously, there's been a lot of um, Scottish independence a, um, discussion and a lot of Brexit so I keep on having to go don't want to see that post don't want to see that post because I'm on social I am very much a, I don't think that social should be where you lecture people on politics unless they really engage with you about it mm. so I tend to go don't want to see that don't want to see that my Facebook feed is constantly don't want to see that click the cross because <laughs> I don't want to see anything to do with politics on my facebook feed either i get it i get it i do all right well let's call it we have been chatting for some time and um ray how would you like to sign out this lovely day well we need we need to talk about what our next book is oh sorry sorry go ahead yeah our Our next book is wolf rain we finally got it if you follow us on twitter you'll already know I finally got hold of a copy of Wolf Rain last Yay, week. Golf so, clap. Golf clap. Yeah. <laughs> that for anyone who doesn't know that, that's a really tiny clap of their fingers on the palm. Um, mm. And so our next book is actually finally Sally's choice of Wolf Rain by Nalini Singh. Mm-hmm. Yep. So <laughs> haven't read it yet. Yay. <sighs> All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much for tuning in and giving us a listen as we discussed A Kingdom of Dreams, 1989, Judith McNaught. How would you like to sign out, Ray? I keep on searching for your happily ever after. And I would remind you that romance isn't dead. It's alive and well on your bookshelf. Bye. Bye.